My name is Patricia Gooden husband I'm a registered manager by trade. Uh, I'm also a specialist dementia care consultant for Fulcrum Care Consultancy. Um, the purpose of this session is to take you to our journey to twice outstanding. Um, so, um, and uh, we will talk mainly through uh, using the VIPS framework and the principle of dementia care mapping and how this helps us to achieve outstanding twice in a three years time. So um, the home that I work is a small co home called Eaton House and we are in um, Datchet in Windsor and um, this is my quote, it's not vain but I, I believe that's what it is. Achieving an outstanding rating isn't a tick box exercise and there's no simple or magic formula. It's about the people and bringing the passion to the care you deliver. So what do we mean by that is um, in order for us to achieve outstanding, we started the journey using the VIPS framework three years before that. So we achieved our first outstanding rating in 2016. But the journey with VIPS framework started in 2013, where um, I really started a journey in terms of evidence-based academic, academic journey in dementia care. Um, and um, I came across the VIPS framework through Dawn Broker. So Dawn Broker is um, uh, in a way the founder of VIPS framework and her work stems from the work of Tom Kin Kin Kitwood around person's person personhood. And um, with person-centered care, what we did, we didn't just look at the residents that we care for. We started from looking at our staff and what our staff need in terms of understanding person-centered care because person-centered care is a rhetoric that's been used and carried on being used with policymakers um, in national guidelines, even by the regulators. But what is the understanding of person-centered care took a long time to be ingrained into practice within our setting because the staff didn't know. So we needed to start with our staff and make, make them understand how they understand themselves, they will be able to understand our resident. So person-centered care in few words is exactly what you can see here, is seeing the world through my eyes. In a way, you're inviting people to come into your world, to hold your hands, to, for, to walk with you, to see with you, to feel with you, to listen to you, and to dance with you. And when a resident or a staff member is saying to you, you're everything I need to carry on, this is what person-centered care means to us in the home that we are. And um, then in order to take that at a different level, we needed more. So we didn't only stop with person-centered care. We went on looking for what makes person-centered care and how we can embrace that into practice. But in order to do that, our home is a very small home. It's a 26-bedded home. It's residential. We care for complex needs. Um, and we looked at how dementia affects our resident, not only the medical side of it, the psychological side of it, and how behavior is the mean of communication. And through that, we've been able to provide as we started the level two dementia care, which is everywhere provided by Skills for Care. And then we had um, different kind of companies started selling their dementia uh, care to us. I encountered Jackie Poole, who was talking yesterday, actually, uh, with her Be Inspired Dementia Framework. And that gave us a big makeover within the home, where we started from baseline, where we looked at um, how we can value people for who they are, as well as value the staff for who they are. Because the work, the work that, that is done by the staff is not always recognized out there. But the staff are the main. Um, you can be a good leader, but if you don't have a staff following, a, a team following you, and if they are not empowered to do their job, there's no way you'll be able to provide person-centered care. So we went into the VIPS framework. The VIPS stand for, as you know, VIPS is a very important person 
and then we add special to it. But in real word, in, in, in academic word, um, VIP's main of valuing the people and those who care for them, treating people as individuals who are unique, looking at the world from the perspective of the, of the person and listening to their voice. So their voice might not just be what they are talking, but how they are behaving, the body language, the need that is expressed through behaviors, and also recognizing that people need an enriched social environment that compensates for their impairment and fosters opportunity for personal growth. By that we mean, to, if I, for example, um, take a resident with dementia and take them around here, there's nothing in this place that will entice them because it's noisy, it's big, um, it's, there's a lot of people. So we tend to make the environment that we have created for our resident very personal to them. Um, as I said again, the home is, is a small unit, it's a small care home, but it's a very homely care home. Our vision statement says it anyway. So what does V stands for? Now, um, when we started using the VIPS framework, we tried to align it. That was in 2000, and then we've moved to 2014. We tried to align it to the CLOE and the essential standards of CQC, which was then in place. So at that time, we had the vision, human resource management, the management ethos, basically the belief system within the, the care setting, training and development for your staff, the service environment, and quality assurance. If we look at all these elements of VIPs, of V today, V, which is valuing people, and you try to align it to the Chloe, you will, re, you will understand what I mean, because there's a, there's, a, there's a next slide, not next one, but there's a slide that relates to this, uh, this slide in terms of Regulation 17 where um, you have to meet Regulation 17, which is good governance. So in order for us to do that, we had to, there's, there's been loads of work, and throughout the journey, as I said, we had the staff, but also we had the owners. Now, I'm a registered manager, I'm employed, um, but it was changing the culture of care within the setting. This was not easy. Uh, because obviously you're talking to a care home that was established, the care home was established, it's, it's, it's been established for more than 30 years, and they have the old-fashioned way of caring. You're, prime, you're trying to put a new model, you're talking a different language, the language of care, it, as opposed to the business language. And when they're seeing, when you're asking them, have you got a mission statement? You're asking the owners, can you put your head together and have a mission statement? And then at a later stage, last year, we asked the staff, can you put your head together to have a vision? So you are involving everybody in that person-centered care. And then we also asked the relatives, what do you want the vision of the home to be? So it's, a, it's working in partnership with all the stakeholders that are within the home. And then we look at human resource, but all the human resource will also link to your staff development, your recruitment, which is really, really important. If you look at um, Chloe Safe, um, S3, for example, where you're looking at your staffing level, are they competent enough, etc. So all these are linked to the Chloe. Um, again, you, go at the, you look at the management ethos. So there will be a slide that I'll be talking about organizational change and how important it is within the VIPS framework. And then we look at individualized care. So a lot of people talk about person-centered care, what it means. So what is person-centered care for each of you? It's different. Each of us today, I'm going to talk about clothing. Each of us today, we decided to wear something that we like to come to, to come, to walk around, something that we are comfortable in. I pick a music, uh, somebody listening to the music. And that expression on the face, it's something that I've picked up on the internet. So it's not, not one of my residents. So GDPR hasn't been breached here. Just be mindful of that. Um, and when you look at 
care planning, when you look at reviews, personal possession, individual preferences, and most importantly, life, in sh life um, history. So when we talk about person-centered care using the VIPS framework, life history has a big, big impact, is a big part of it. Because without the life history, there's no way you'll be able to understand a behavior of concern or response to that behavior. Because that behavior is a communicate, the, the person is communicating something to you. And that's part of their life history that they are trying to talk to you. We recently had a lady coming to us. Um, and um, obviously, we will name the lady Mrs. Smith, although that's not her name. And um, we couldn't understand. I mean, we could understand, but the family couldn't understand her behavior. And when we went out, I went out with one of my colleagues who is sitting in the audience today, and we went out assessing, assessing the lady. And within about 20 to 30 minutes, I spoke to the husband, and I can see his frustration because the wife is living, is, is living with him, but referring to him as the past boyfriend. Now, how frustrating that is for a husband. They've been married for 53 years, and he couldn't comprehend why. But by explaining to him the why behind, behind the behavior, he understood, and it makes sense to him that that was part of her life, and she's reverted back to it. So life history has been also something that we had to, to train our staff on how to gather those information. It wasn't easy for them to gather information. Information doesn't come from family only. It comes from the neighbors, from friends, from doctors, from whoever has been involved in the care of that person. And then we move on looking at the, at the perspective of the person. What does the person is seeing? I can see a red Volkswagen Passat driving. But Somebody with dementia will probably see a beetle, a red beetle passing by. It's a car, it's a motorized vehicle, but it's not a Passat because a Passat is just a new model and they are just reverting back. So we see through the world, if you go back to the poem that I put up there, you see the world through their perspective, through their eyes. And that's what VIPS framework gave us give us the tool and the resources. So under each of these elements, under each of these elements, there, there are subsections that gives you a lot of tools and resources to help yourself to manage the care home or the care setting where you are in, but also help your staff in terms of training. And then we looked at social environment. Now, we had to go through a lot of changes, but the changes were gradual. Gradual so that it, isn't, it, doesn't, it didn't um, upset the resident. It didn't disorientate them in what they were doing. Um, so we look at, at a way of how they will be included. So they had the choice, for example, of furniture. It was their choice. It was not the staff choice. Curtains. You had few people that were able still to voice their opinion, and you had relatives that were there that were able to say, well, mom had that color, or my dad like this. So obviously, we wouldn't be able to cater for everybody, but we tried to put all of these choices together. And we wanted to make the place very warm for them to live in, to wake up in, to have a 24-hour walking around without feeling um, really a stranger in a, in a place. It, there's no long corridors, so um, each individual doors are, are in a way uh, designed and designed for that individual living in that room. We have memory boxes in, in each of their room, in their door, etc. And we have a sense of community. So for example, Part of my role as well, you would see, I'm also a specialist consultant for Fulcrum. And we go into care homes. And one of the words I can't bear 
is wandering. They are wandering around. They are wandering. This is a wanderer. This is... She wanders. She steals from one room to another, etc., etc. That person needs something. It's a communication of need. And again, I'll give you an example. We, we had a referral from another care home where they couldn't care, supposedly, for a lady because she was wandering. So we went in. Yes, she walks a lot. But she walks a lot because she was bored. There was nothing for her to do. She walks a lot because there was no purpose for her. So we said, oh, yeah, we'll take that challenge. We can do that. So we took her on board. We got her life history from her daughter. And the, told, the daughter told us she used to walk every morning to drop her children to school. Every afternoon or every lunchtime, some of them needed um, lunch. So she would walk again. And in the afternoon, she would walk again. So what did we do in terms of personalizing her care? We are fortunate enough to, lead, to, to work next to a school. Not next, but you still have to walk. So we agreed with the daughter that we will provide a care staff either in the morning or in the afternoon, 30 minutes. So that's a one-to-one. One-to-one -one. One -one activity, 30 minutes, walking with the resident. And what she was doing, she thought, she was um, helping kids going to school. She loved it. Coming back to the home, she was not walking or wandering as some would describe her. But she, we felt she wanted to be busy, so we gave her a duster. All she kept on doing is wiping. I mean, we don't have any stain on the, on the handrail because that's what she kept on doing. Uh, and then she kept on folding Everything she was folding and wrapping. So we realized it was the motherhood that she was needing. So we managed to get dose therapy in. And we managed to get her um, a prom. And we got her some baby clothes. We got her free dolls. But it's free babies. We don't use the, word term we don't use the terminology dolls. So we got her free because she has three children. So we got her free. And she got busy. And then we realized this is what she was doing. So that's her baby. And the tapping was just warm and comfort. And with that in mind, we've managed to give that person, that lady, a person-centered care. That's what person-centered care is all about. But in order to do that, again, we go back to giving the staff the tools, the resources, the time. So all the staff are trained at dementia level, different dementia level. Uh, some are dementia care coaches. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some from the cleaners to the, to the kitchen staff to the gardeners, everybody knows about dementia. Because some of the residents love what we call the outdoor living. So what do you do when it's snowing? Do you go out or do you stay home because everything stops when it's, when it's snowing? Or do you go out? Go out. If it's raining, you still go out. And if it's sunny, of course you will go out. And that's exactly what we do with our residents. If it's snowing, we take them out, we allow them to feel the snow. Because today, when it's snowing, UK is on a meltdown. 60 years or 50 years ago, those people were walking in the snow. They were dropping their school, their, their kids to school in the snow. They were walking in the rain. They were going to the shop in the rain. They were living in, in the weather. So why do we have to stop? So the VIPS frameworks give you the, the opportunity to take positive risk. And it, there, there's elements in there that tell you about positive risk-taking. The other thing that we do as well in terms of outdoor is taking the residents out. There's, if it's sunny and we haven't planned, it's not on the planner, it's not on the, oh, the activity organizer is not there. There's no such thing. Everybody has been DBS checked. Everybody has had the training in dementia. Everybody knows how to use non-pharmacotical approaches within the home. 
And we are not a nursing home. We are a residential dementia home. We are specialized. So it is, it is that element of VIPS framework that help us to get our first outstanding in 2016. Now, how does the VIPS framework, I told you I'm going to talk about it. The VIPS framework relates to the CLOE, and here it's about Regulation 17. So all this area relates to V, when you talk about the management ethos, the change of culture, um, you're talking about staff development and training, you're talking about a vision, you're talking about social environment, you're talking about quality assurance. <coughs> all this falls under CLOE, um, I think it's CLOE, all of them, mainly well-led, all the sectors of well-led, but most importantly, you're covering Regulation 17. Once you've done all of this, you tick all the boxes and you put all your evidence in, CQC will be happy with you. Because if you're using the VIPS framework, you're using what we will call an evidence-based practice. It's been recognized. It is within the NICE guidelines. The VIPS framework is in a lot of research papers since 2011, and it hasn't stopped. It's still. VIPS framework has been, again, um, expanded to the Netherlands, to Germany, to Australia, and to Canada. Alongside the VIPS framework, we use what we call the dementia care mapping. So I'm also a dementia care mapper, which means I sit, I observe people, I observe staff engagement with residents. So the dementia care mapping um, is an observational tool used to measure the quality of care being given to people with dementia in correlation with both their quality of life and the impact of the care setting in meeting their social, psychological, and physical needs. It is also used to measure the interaction between staff and residents. Further down the presentation, I mention that the DCM is also the same tool that is used by the inspectors, which we call the SOFI 2. But they have a different approach by using the SOFI 2. So the dementia care mapping was developed initially in, 2000 and in 1992 by, by um, Kitwood and Bredin, and then developed more by um, Dawn Broker, Professor Dawn Broker, with University of Bradford. And now it's been used for over 20 years, but it's becoming more and more a tool that's used to evaluate your service, develop your service, improve your service in implementing person-centered care. There's quite a few dementia care mappers around the country. Um, the University of, um, I'm not selling their product, but that's the only university that does the training. Um, they, they facilitate that the, the initial training is for four days, and then if you want to go for on an advanced one, it's another four days. So what does the dementia care mapping do? It looks at behaviors. It's, it's a coding framework, so obviously you need to go on there to understand it. But when you see CQC sitting into your, your lounge, your dining room, sitting and observing, that's exactly what they are doing. They are observing each and every interaction your staff are having with your resident, i.e., are they engaging, which is positive enhancement, or are they ignoring? They're just walking by, and poor Daisy keeps on just doing this. In dementia, in dementia care mapping, when somebody is ignoring, it is called a personal detractor. So basically, you're ignoring the resident. You're not taking care of them. So dementia care mapping help you to balance the... That's why I've put, I've put, the, I've put the design in the middle, because the person is in the middle. In between, you have the big, the big iron one is your system and proce processes in place, and the small one. Why is it small? Because it's a staff member who's basically um, burdened with all your system and processes. However, the minute you implement the dementia care mapping into your setting, you'll realize how the staff enjoy their job because they can engage, they can talk, they can cook, they can ask residents who are able to come and make the bed with them, empty the bin with them, positive risk-taking, 
Once you're doing all of this, you're ticking all of the CQC, what CQC want to see. They want to see engagement. They want to see you going um, ahead of the game and bringing evidence-based practice to your setting. One of them, one of, um, one of responsive, uh, I think it's responsive one, talks about using evidence-based practice in your workforce or in your workplace. And this is what they are looking at. They are looking whether you are aware of what's out there. So all these information are out there. Again, DCM has brought a lot of challenges in our setting. Um, however, it has also helped us to develop a new culture. A new culture where this is not how we do it. We do it differently. We do it in a way where change is or need to happen. We need to, we need to be able to use all the resources that we put in place. But the resources don't have to be expensive. The training is, I have to say, where we use evidence-based training. By trade, I'm also what we will call a dementia practice development coach. I gained the title through taking um, a double unit at level seven with the Association of Dementia Studies at a master's level, which I'm about to finish in a month because um, I'm, writing, I'm writing a dissertation at the moment. But the training that we did, it's called the Focus Intervention Training and Support. It's a specialized dementia training. You start from scratch. Anyone who comes in your system who doesn't have a clue about dementia will know it by the end of those 10 sessions. They will know the basic of it, but they will know the enriched care, enriched person-centered care model as well. They will know how to use non-pharmaceutical approaches. By using all these evidence base, we have been able to reduce antipsychotic and being part of different NHS projects. We've reduced antipsychotic from, at the beginning we had nine, to having only two. Those two, they need it, not because they have dementia, but because they've got a mental illness, which is completely different. So we've been able to work with other health professionals. When a resident comes to us, despite the fact that we are not a nursing home, they stay because the staff have learned how to provide end-of-life person-centered care. So, unfortunately, we didn't get, um, it was a bit too late to gain consent to put a statement on, but a statement that we, obviously for, for GDPR purposes, but the statement within the lines were the best care ever from the day my mom walked into this home until the day she was buried. I didn't even have to prepare her funeral. You did it all for us. That is a sentiment of what person-centered care is all about. It's not just about all the rhetoric that goes around person-centered care, all the policymakers that don't take into account that the staff is at the forefront of person-centered care. Invest in your staff, give them time, give them resources, give them the tool that is required, empower them in decision making, give them the control of their job. You will retain them, you will not be chasing or advertising, because we don't, we retain staff. We don't, we don't need to advertise. Sometimes those who've left, they've left for personal reason, illness or dementia care wasn't for them. But all those who are staying, and all those who are new, they just love it. Have you walked, have you ever walked into care homes? There are good care homes out there, let me tell you. But when you walk into a care home and you, and the, you can see staff are just task orientated as opposed to activity orientated, as opposed to sitting, having a cup of tea with Mrs. Jones, who's feeling lonely today. So. In terms of staff, I, I, I talk a lot about it because VIP's framework has been recently recommended as well in the new document, which is Managing Success in Dementia Care, November 2018. It's a document that's been based on research. It's um, a document that's been uh, drafted by University of Leeds. 
And um, it's also in the new dementia guidelines from NICE, which is the NG97. So that's the national guidelines. So it's there, it's out there. Use it. I don't get anything for selling it to you, but what I do get is providing person-centered care to the resident, empowering the staff. That's what I get. Again, we talked about organizational change, culture change. The minute you talk about culture change in a care home, this is the picture that you will get. They are very, very anxious. Oh, we don't do it this way. You are the new one, you're the newbie. That's not the way we do it. We always used to do it this way. But this way that you, do, you did it before is not person-centered care. The way you used to do it before is institutionalized care. Person-centered care is when you walk in in the morning, you are able to put a new hat on, a smiley face when you're walking, your personal trouble stays by the door because you are enjoying your job. You're not just here, you're not just a carer. We've borrowed that terminology, I'm just a carer. You are a person. It's not just being a carer. So valuing the staff is, if you want to get person-centered care, value the staff. Tell your organization to put the staff at the forefront of every single thing that you do. I'm going to move on now and talk about Fulcrum, which is what I do as well, and I'm a specialist consultant there. And Fulcrum is a care consultancy company, um, and uh, we all specialize in taking care homes from special measures, I'm not saying from good to outstanding, from special measures to good, or from special measures to requires improvement, not even to adequate, inadequate, but from special measures, which is you have 28 days or three months to get it right, and that's what Fulcrum does. Fulcrum gives you sustainability to move to good or to move towards outstanding. Obviously, I've been kind of headhunted by, headhunted by, by Fulcrum because of the double outstanding. We achieved outstanding in 2016. We've just achieved outstanding in March. And we've achieved again in free, in free domain, which gave us an, an overall outstanding. So basically we've retained our outstanding. Achieving it was hard, was really hard. We use we use a lot of uh, technology. Our care planning system is electronic. Our medication management is electronic. Um, Residents have their say on, on, uh, on the food, on activities. Again, we've been able to retain by being innovative, by being creative. And that's what got us our double outstanding. So Fulcrum uses a quality management system which aligns with the CLOE. So all the 24 components of the CLOE is highlighted in, in, um, in that audit system. It's called the eye auditor. So we are at stand D12, and there's some leaflet on the, on the chair. But if you look into it, you'll find out it's an, it's an audit that can be used at management level, director's level, but also at staff level because as a manager, you'll be able to delegate those audits, but you'll, be able, you'll also be able to monitor them because you will put a time scale. For example, let me give you a simple example. CQC love your cleaning audit, but who does your cleaning audit? It's not just the tick boxes. Your cleaning audit should be done by your, the person that does the domestic, that does the cleaning. They should be able to say that room is clean. So they can tick, yes, that room is clean, that room is clean, etc. So an average they've done, let's say, 25%. They've checked, I don't know, 10 bedrooms. And they've put a note. But that's personal. And when CQC, because when we had our inspection and we've told CQC that we use iAuditor, and they went, oh, you're well in advance. You're being very proactive. Yes, because we go to sessions like this, like the care show, but we inform ourselves in what we do a lot. The other part is the person-centered TV, which is basically person-centered as the word says it. So you can personalize video, 
personalized song, film, the menu for your resident, and it's based on individual resident spaces. Again, um, I'm going to just brush on how VIPS sits within your inspection. So VIPS sits in a secure inspection because you're working in a person-centered way. You're promoting equality and diversity and human rights. You provide access and information. You cover your safeguarding. So VIPS take care of all these information that I've just put there. But most importantly, when you're looking at the mom test that was created by Andrea Sutcliffe, the former CQC chief inspector, she talked about the mom test. Use the VIPS framework, you'll realize if your home is really meeting the mom test. And as I said earlier on, this is what the SOFI does. The SOFI goes along with the dementia care mapping. So in a way, uh, whatever a dementia care mapper is doing, the inspector is doing the same thing. It's observing what the staff engagement is within the care home. Thank you.